Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, amma ba'da, habita fillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, hayyakum Allah jami'an, and welcome back to our study of al-Aqidata al-Tahawiyya. And we reach the section of the treaties uh, where Imam al-Tahawi discusses extensively or mention some very important ibarat and statements regarding these uh, leaders in Islam and their manzil, their position, and how Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'a, how they ta'amal mal Sultan, how Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'a, how they interact with the Sultan or the leader of the Muslims or leaders of the Muslims, as we see in contemporary times that the Ummah is, is, has divided with the advent of nation states where there's many, many numerous countries all having their own leader and leadership <coughs> and styles of government and rulership. But how, what is the Muslim's position with regards to uh, dealing with the Muslim ruler? So this uh, section of the treaties, Imam al Tahawis will discuss some of those uh, very important uh, asul of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah regarding this uh, topic. And also, Ahabatifillah, we just want to realize that in during the course of this uh, lesson, that one of the objectives is for us to get a strong understanding based on the book in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and what was codified uh, in the methodology of the Salaf of this Ummah with regards to our position with the Muslim authority. And this is by studying, or this will be achieved by studying this portion of the text, uh, the text which illustrates for us the Iqtiqad wa Madhab, the me methodology and the the creed of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah regarding the Muslim uh, ruler. So Imam Al Tahawi, rahmatullahi alayhi, rahmatin wasi'a, will backtrack a little bit to the last statement that we mentioned prior to this sitting, and that was Imam Al Tahawi. He said, <clears throat> We do not believe in taking up the sword against any of the Ummah of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, except upon those for whom it is. Obligatory. So here Imam al Tahawi mentions that the issue, that this is a base issue of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, of the Muslimin, is that we don't fight and kill one another. And that's a simple uh, something which should be understood. However, he also in, in, uh, implied or implicitly in his statement, he implies that there are uh, those who it is uh, lawful that they may have done, be guilty of certain sins and certain crimes which could warrant uh, under Islamic law and Sharia the uh, termination of their life, meaning uh, execution. So Islam clearly within the core text shows us that execution is something uh, a part of the penal code uh, of Islamic Sharia. And we mentioned in the last lecture some of the circumstances which would warrant, uh, for example, a person taking a life uh, that is a life for a life. So if they were found guilty, then the Sharia calls for uh, the retribution and that members of the family can get the rep retribution through the court system, through the rule of law, through the hakam, the leader of the Muslims, or the qadi, the Muslim judge, uh, have that person's, uh, you know, the, as retribution, they can be executed. Uh, or they may have the, the option of uh, receiving blood money, you know, compensation for their life, of their family member that was lost. And 
some of the other punishments as those scholars who hold uh, that the person who has left the Salat, as the Prophet ﷺ said, Man taraka salat fikad kafara, whoever leaves the prayer has disbelieved, then those scholars who believe that in takfir of the one who has abandoned the prayer believes that this person should be given uh, in front of the ruler, should be given the chance to recant, to make toba and begin to pray again, or that their life should be taken, uh, that that under Islamic law. So that is another case, the one who has abandoned the prayer, that there is actually a sharia punishment for that. And the other situation would be the one going uh, going out against the Muslims, revolting against the Muslims, splitting up the jama'ah, causing fitna, that they are also those people who uh, are, that there's a punishment, a sharia-based punishment with regards to their action, which uh, this punishment involves taking their life. And there are other scenarios as well. So it's very important the shahid here of mentioning this again is to show the sanctity of the Muslim, that the Muslim uh, is honor, his wealth or her wealth and her honor and their life is sacred and it is uh, to be preserved in under Islamic law, that this is something, you know, the sanctity of the Muslim. And what we see with those groups that violate this, because this uh, statement of Imam at tahawi is also showing us, uh, you know, Imam at tahawi is affirming that this, that the Muslim's blood is sacred. So how is it that we have groups like the Khawarij who make takfir of the people for major sins and then uh, fought them and stole their wealth or they believed in rebelling against the Muslim ruler? All of these are violations. So Imam at tahawi here is actually refuting the ittiqad and the mu'amalat of the khawarij, the creed of the khawarij, because this has to do with their creed as well. They believe in uh, making takfir of those who do the major sins and and make their blood lawful. So that makes it an, an issue of, uh, there's an issue, an element of aqidah there. And then likewise, as far as their actual action, this has to do with the mu'amalat, the the actions and their interactions in practicing that. So perhaps you might say that that might be minhajiyya as well. And in the next statement, Imam at tahawi he says, we do not believe in revolting against our leaders and rulers. Even if they commit injustice, nor do we pray against them or defy their orders. On the contrary, we believe that obedience to them is a duty and a part of our obedience to Allah. So long as they do not order anything sinful, we pray for their safety and piety. Look at this statement of Imam al Tahawi here. And we have to remember uh, 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 Abu Ja'far al Tahawi that he wrote this. You know, his his Aqidah, this is around uh, 300 Hijri. You know, he, he died 321 Hijri. So this is around that time, that time period. Rahmatullahi alayhi rahmatin wasiya. And that shows us that this Mas'ala, this issue, this foundation of Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah was codified in the early classical text of Aqidah, of Creed. And that Imam al Tahawi here is espousing this very principle that this is an, an asl min usul al Ahlu Sunnah. This is a foundation principle from amongst the foundation principles of Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah. And look at the, the Masail. He mentions in this ibarah, in this one statement, he mentions several masail. He says, we do not believe in revolt against our leaders 
and rulers. So first he's talking about the issue of revolting. And he's negating it, which is a rud on the Khawarij and the contemporary Tekfiris. Secondly, he says, even if they commit injustice, so meaning if they're uh, a sinful, they're wicked, they're an oppressor, they're pr imprisoning the ulama, because these are arguments that the neo-Tekfiris use these uh, arguments to make Tekfir of the Muslim rulers all the time. Nor do we pray against them. So the second issue is, is that Ahl sunnah does not pray against the Muslim ruler. So the first issue is what? We don't revolt against them. The second issue is what? That we do not pray against them. We don't supplicate against the ruler. Instead, the opposite, as we see from the Salaf, that the opposite is the case. We actually pray for the wicked oppressor that they will be rectified and that they will rectify themselves. Or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide them and give them rectification. Uh, even if they commit injustice, nor do we pray against them. And then the third issue, or defy their orders. This is very important as well. So the third mas'ala, min masail, fi hadhi al-ibara. The third issue from amongst these issues in this statement is that we do not defy the ruler's order. So if the, the ruler orders you to do that which involves obedience to a law, even if they are a wicked sinner, you do not disobey them. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Asam'i wa ta'a ala marya al-Muslim fi ma yuhibbu wa kariya ma lam yu'miru bi ma'asiyatin the Prophet والسلام, said, as collected in Sahih Bukhari, uh, Sahih Muslim, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Asami wa ta'ala Maryal Muslim. He said, hearing and obeying the Muslim leader. That's not a, a, a contemporary ideology. This is coming from our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Kumtum Mu'minin. If you are believers, if you are believers, you will accept that. So our beloved Prophet ﷺ said, Muslim, uh, be obedient to the Muslim ruler. In what you like, so in what pleases you and what displeases you, meaning there are going to be things he's going to order you with which you don't like. We don't like to get traffic tickets. We don't like to get traffic stops. We don't like to, whatever the case may be. And then he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, As long as he doesn't command you to ma'asiyah, to sinfulness. And then what, how, how should we operate with that? How should we engage with the leader at this point? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, فَلَا سَمْعَ وَلَا طَعَ He says, and if he orders you with sinfulness, meaning that it's disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no hearing and there's no obeying, meaning there is no hearing and obeying. There's no listening or following this, this order in disobedience to Allah. And what is very important here, as far as the, the understanding between, uh, of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah versus the understanding of the Khawarij and the Neo Tekfiris and other groups is that Ahl Sunnah believes that there's no hearing and obeying in this mas'ala, in the mas'ala of disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas Ahl Takfir and the Khawarij and the people of extremism, they understand this to mean that that negates his ta'a completely. He ordered something disobe to disobey Allah, this negates his obedience in everything. No. Let you, and you can rebel and so forth. No, this whole, this hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gives us this issue and, and, and solidifies for us what Imam al-Tahawi is saying. Because the asl is the nas. The asl is we return back to the Quran and the Sunnah, which we will shortly do, and mention some of those nasus uh, that, uh, that's coming from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The fourth mas'ala here, the fourth issue in this statement 
of Imam of Tahawis. He says, on the contrary, so this means in opposition, we believe that obedience to them, meaning the Muslim ruler, is a duty and a part of our obedience to Allah. Allahu Akbar. Look at this, Ahabatifillah. So Imam Tahawi here, the fourth issue, in this ibadah, just in this statement, he says, in contrary, we believe that obedience to them is a duty and a part of our obedience to Allah. This is very, very important because you'll see many of the scholars in the past, as well as contemporary scholars who expound upon this issue, meaning that they talk more in depth about this issue, that they point out the whole thing has to do, this whole issue is built upon obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are obeying the Muslim authority because you are ordered to in the Quran and you are ordered to in the Sunnah and you don't rebel against them because you are ordered to cease from that. In the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as far as the, the details. And this was the madhab of the Salaf. So it's very, very important that we understand this. He says, on the contrary, we believe that obedience to them, the Muslim authority, is a duty and a part of our obedience to Allah. So that's a part of your worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a part of your obedience, your ta'a. Ta'atil imam, ta'atillah. As long as he doesn't command you to disobedience to Allah. Obedience to the imam, the Muslim ruler, Muslim president even, is obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As long as he is giving you that which is muafaka, which is in agreement with the shara. So if the leader says you must pray, we already know we have to pray from the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that is muafaka. That's in accordance with Allah, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. So therefore, when you obey the ruler and he says, yeah, you need to pray at such and such time and it's within the time for Salat, then you need to pray at that time because your obedience to his command is actually obedience to Allah because that's the asl is that you have to pray from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the Prophet said, فَإِذَا أُمِرَ بِمَعْسِيَةٍ And if he commands you to disobedience, فَلَا سَمْعَ وَلَا طَعَ There is no hearing and there's no obeying. And so this forms the foundation of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. This is, or this is a part of the usul of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. The anna huwa asl min usul Ahl Sunnah. This is a foundation principle from amongst the principle principles of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So we see that this is very important. And then Imam al tahawi he gives, he says, that he lets us know it's muqayyid. And that's what we find from the hadith. From the hadith, we know it's muqayyid, meaning it's restricted. This obedience to the leader is restricted. But the obedience to Allah, wa rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, mutlaq. It's ala itlaq. Ta'a mutlaqin. That you have obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without question. There's no debating and arguing and, <clears throat> you know, thinking to wiggle out of it. That in and of itself, you are obedient to your Lord. He created you. He knows you best. And that is your duty to him. And the hukum is for him. We don't have to question it. We don't have to, you know, be fickle in that issue. Likewise, to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, because he's the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So that is ta'a mutlaq. It is ta'a mutlaq. And then ta'a muqayyid, the restricted type of obedience, has to do with the obedience of the leader, because your obedience to the leader is mushtarat. It is something that's conditional. Uh, it is built upon his obedience to Allah. And when he's not obedient to Allah, you still obey him unless his command, what he's commanding you to do is disobedience to Allah. For example, if the leader says, you must drink alcohol, you must, our youth must have girlfriends, 
We, you know, it's now permissible and you need to have this. Okay. Let's forget the permissible thing. Because we're not, we don't want to get in. This is another issue when we talk about istihlal, making something, making the unlawful lawful. But if the leader, he, he allows us to go. You know, he knows it's wrong. But it's contemporary times. He knows it's disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He just wants to lighten up the UN pressure, whatever the case may be. This is ma'asiyatillah. This is a great sin. However, it doesn't negate obedience to a leader except obedience in that command. Meaning he has commanded you now to have girlfriends. He says, no, you, you go ahead and have a girlfriend. I, I don't necessarily, you know, he doesn't have to say that out loud that he doesn't believe it. But that's between him and, and his Lord because we can't, you know, make teftish of his, his heart. But he's allowed that as riba, as usury and all kind of other sins might take place that are known to the leader or that the leader more or less allows or does allow. That does not negate his obedience. That doesn't make him a disbeliever. It makes him a wicked sinner. For example, if you have children, this is on the micro level. If you have children and they're doing disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you still let them live in your house and you know that they're watching Muharramat. They're listening to Muharramat. You don't like that. But you say, man, I'd rather you listen to Yo MTV Raps instead of going out on the street and being in a gang. Okay? So you allow them to do that. You know, you allow them, you know, they're teenagers. There's not much you can do now. You've They've grown up and it's very difficult for you. You could kick them out, but then you see also that there's a harm. You kick them out in the street. <clears throat> so you allow that disobedience. Does that mean now you're ruling by what other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed? No, that is not that you have, you have not made that lawful. It is a, a disobedience. However, with regards to this issue, you have allowed some disobedience. And in this issue, it's a khafa darain. It's the lesser of the two evils, kicking them out. You know they're going to join the gang. You know they're going to be homeless. You know all these kind of other bad things that are more than likely going to happen and that they're very close to already. So you allowed another sin in your home. Not saying it's halal, but you, you allowed it. You allowed it. So that does not make you a disbeliever in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so it's very important to understand this part of the mas'ala because this also is pertinent to, it's relevant to our discussion about the Muslim leader. And so, uh, and then the last point he said, so long as they do not order anything sinful. And we, we just discussed that. And then what did he say? Very, very important, the statement of Imam At-Tahawi here. He says, we pray for their safety and piety. Look at this. This shows us the, the how Ahl Sunnah is a big divide. It's a big gap between Ahl Sunnah and Ahl al Bid'ah, especially Ahl al Bid'ah from the Khawarij, Mu'tazila, and groups like this, because they believed the sword. They believed in the sword to rectify things. But they didn't, instead of going to the Sunnah of the Prophet, وسلم, and instead of having the proper understanding of the book and the Sunnah, of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And so on this, Imam Ibn Abi Izz, he says, Allah says, so he begins with uh, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as evidence to support what Imam al Tahawi is saying. And what Imam al Tahawi is saying is from the usul of Ahl Sunnati wa Jama'ah, is affirming for us the usul of Ahl Sunnati wa Jama'ah, which has to do with all the Messiah we've studied thus far in this text. He says, Allah says, oh, uh, you who believe, oh, you who believe, obey Allah and obey the messenger and those charged with authority amongst you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya yaladina amanu, atiyu Allah wa atiyu rasul, wa ulil amri minkum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, oh, you who believe, obey Allah and obey his messenger and those charged and authority over you. And as we explained already, as the ulama mentioned, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya yuladina amanu, atiyu Allah wa atiyu rasul, have them ala itlaq. Have them mutlaqin. Ta'am mutlaqin. Meaning when Allah says, O you who believe, obey Allah and obey as a messenger, 
that that is unrestricted obedience. There's no question. It's no, you know, debating and arguing and thinking, rethinking it. That is it. Obey Allah and obey his messenger. When it comes to the leader, although it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that, he mentions it. What do you need after that? Ya yaladina amanu. Oh, you who believe. If you believe, you're, you're listening. Your ears are open. Ya yaladina amanu. Wa atiyu laha. Obey Allah. And obey his messenger. And then there's another wow. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa and minkum, and those charged in authority over you. So that lets us know that part of obedience to Allah wa Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is ta'a li Wali uh, al-Amr To the Muslim ruler That's a part of your obedience to Allah That's a part of your obedience To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala That's why, you know There's no room for how the Khawarij understood this How the Neo-Takfiris understand this That, that, they're just, it just We don't really have any discussion or debate that we need to deal with that. Really, we just go back to the book and the sunnah. And we go back to the understanding of the salaf. And that's why we're studying classical texts which illustrate for us the sunnah and the menhaj. The methodology of the salaf of this ummah. How did they understand? How did the classical salaf? What did the sahaba, what did we learn from the sahaba? Especially what was codified. And what I mean by codified, because you'll find some of the doubts that some of the people of Tekfir in contemporary time use. Now, I don't know about the classical times. I don't think, because most of the books you find later on, they pretty much were almost, I, I don't know of any Akita books that aren't clear about this issue. They all are very clear, do not obey the Muslim ruler. I mean, do not disobey the Muslim ruler. Do not rebel against the Muslim ruler. They're very clear. However, when we look at the uh, the neo takfiris especially in contemporary times, which we need to be aware from, the, even though we're talking about this classical text, but this has implications for us, is we see that one of their arguments is that uh, that they try to back up what their 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 bid'a by saying, well, some of the tabi'in or it's by tabi'in. You know, they rebelled against Hajjaj and, and so and so, and they'll mention uh, individuals from the Salaf. How do we understand that? Well, we understand that, Ahabat Fillah, is we look back and we say that this was before, it, it, from Wajhain, two ways. One is that this was before really the codification, meaning that the in the in the in the books that the 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 scholars, those early scholars that wrote about these topics, this was before the issue became very, very clear for them. You know, on how to how to deal with these nusus because that's a test. Someone's oppressing you; they're killing the Sahaba. What you know? It'd be easy at that point to raise your sword against the, uh, someone who's doing this. That's easy from your desires or. Two ways, from the desires or from the ijtihad of imams. Great imams. Imams from the salaf. But some of them believed, you know, in fighting and resisting that evil from the leader without even make, without making tikfir. And this is what distinguishes between the khawarij and rebels. So that's another point. There's a whole other mas'ala. Distinguishing between the bughat well, Khawarij, the Khawarij, as the scholars, they, they mention, you'll find different things mentioned uh, by some of the scholars with regards to uh, distinguishing the two. But one of the core things, you know, because the scholars have written extensively about this, one of the core things that they mention, Ahabatifillah, is that the Khawarij, it's an issue of Aqidah. It's creed-based. Whereas the Bughat, a person who was a rebel, that they are, they have rebelled against the Muslim authority, and it's based on their ijtihad. It's not a belief 
that they've made tech fear of them and they have an ideology supporting that, but rather they say, hey, there's a lot of oppression going on. We're fighting back, okay? Whereas the Khawarij, they actually make tech fear. So it's an issue. It's a creedal, in a, uh, creedal issue. So I hope that that's clear. That's one of the core ways that we can distinguish that. And for more details, we need to go back and, and research uh, some of the other tafasil, some of the other details that these scholars uh, mention with regards to this mas'ala. So that's something very important for us to understand. So Imam uh, Ibn Abi Iz, he begins by mentioning uh, this ayah. So he first uh, deals with this. He, de he, he first deals with this issue by Nas, which is the menaj of the ah Ahl Sunnah, that he goes right back to the text, the core text, the divine text, the qala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, He says, Ya yuladina amanu, wa atiyu Allah wa atiyu rasul. Ya yuladina amanu, wa atiyu Allah wa atiyu rasul. Oh, you who believe, obey Allah and obey his messenger. And so he goes right back to the text. He brings you the evidence. And then he says, in the sahih. So then he begins to mention the leo from the sunnah of the Prophet He said, in the sahih, it is recorded that he, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, says, whoever obeys me, obeys Allah. Whoever obeys the ruler, obeys me. And whoever disobeys the ruler, disobeys me. This is a sahih sound hadith. So he begins with the ayat, then he begins with a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to show, look at this hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and what we gain from this. In the sahih, it is recorded that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever obeys me, obeys Allah. Ati Allah wa ati Rasul. Whoever obeys the ruler, obeys me. If you obey the ruler of the Muslims, even if he's a wicked sinner, but you don't obey him in his wicked sin. But if he's a drunkard, drunkard, but he still commands you to do good deeds, you need to pray. You need to uh, do, uh, you know, zakat is being is is established in the land, and we're gonna we pay. We you can give zakat to, for the government to distribute. You know, we have these. Um, Beit al-mal and, and things like this. We obey. We obey the Muslim ruler. And that's what we learn from this hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Abu Dhar radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that his friend, meaning the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Can you imagine that you, you were saying my friend and you're talking about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with all the sahaba to Rasul. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Radiyallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in. He says, he says that his friend, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, asked him to hear and obey even if the, the ruler happens to be an Ethiopian slave with mutilated fingers. And this is one of the uh, narrations that you'll find in Sahih Muslim and Ibn Majah in his chapter on Al-Jihad and Musnad Imam Ahmed. So he says, even if he has a uh, mutilated friend, and uh, in Bukhari's version of the hadith, the last words are, even if he is an Ethiopian man with a head as small as a raisin. The two sahihs also have the hadith that the Prophet wasallam said, it is the duty of every Muslim to hear and obey whether he likes it or not, except when he is asked to do something sinful. In that case, he should not hear or obey. And that's the hadith we, we mentioned. That's hadith Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And this is, uh, you'll find this in Bukhari and Muslim. In, Muslim in Kitab al-Imara and also uh, in uh, Tirmidhi. And Ahmed. Also in, in so in many hadith collections, but it's amazing how the people want to follow so many contemporary mubtadia. People call us to takfir, call us to the hellfire. Our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, Al Khawarij Kilab Nar. The Khawarij are the dogs of the hellfire. So there's nothing lower. <laughs> Than that, than being the dogs of the hellfire, that is a that is a wicked station to have. Hudayfa radiyallahu anhu bin Yaman said that the people inquired about good things, but he inquired about the evil. 
so that he might not be caught in them. Once he asked, messenger, uh, O Messenger of Allah, we live in evil and ignorance. Then Allah brought us this good. Will evil come after this good? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, yes. He asked, will there be good after this evil? He Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, yes, it will be uh, polluted. Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala asked, how will it be polluted? Kayfa dukhun. He said, there will be people whose ways will differ from my ways and who will live a life different from that of mine. Some of their deeds will be correct and some wrong. Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala asked, will there be an evil after that good? The Prophet ﷺ said, yes, there will be preachers at the gates of hell. A dua ta'ala abwaaba jahannam. Whoever responds to their call will be thrown into it. He requested, Messenger of Allah, please tell me about them. The Prophet ﷺ said, certainly they will have, uh, they will be, you know, basically from our people, skin like ours, and they will speak our language. Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala asked, Messenger of Allah, what would you like me to do if it happens in my lifetime? He sallallahu alayhi wa said, stick to the jama'ah of the Muslims and their imam. Hudayfa then said, suppose they have no jama'ah, no, no united group, and no imam, no leader. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, then keep away from all those groups even if you have to eat the roots of trees until you meet death and you are in that matter. You are in that manner. Look at this hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A hadith in Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood in Kitab al-Fitan. Andr al Sound hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Showing us so many lessons. In and of itself, that is a lesson. But with regards to the topic that Imam al tahawi is talking about here, it's talking about the fitna of those people who leave the jama'ah, who rebel against the Muslim leader, call, uh, raise the sword against the Muslim leader. Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala who narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, if any of you find something in your ruler that you do not approve of, you should bear it patiently. For one who moves a span's length from the jama'ah and dies, dies the death of jahiliyyah, the days of ignorance. In another version, the words are, he has thrown away his allegiance to Islam. So it shows us how dangerous it is to split from the body of the Muslims, to be with the khawarij. And if we look at in contemporary lessons, when we look at uh, groups like al-Qaeda, to no doubt a, a great extent, but look at ISIS, as, as, you know, uh, Daesh and these groups, how much more that they fit this description. They were, I, I, it's almost I envision that when I think about the way they use their propaganda machine to call the youth from around the earth to come join them, be misguided, to be destroyed physically and in every other way. And that's how they're going to meet their Lord, many of them many of them youth from all over the world, what a blow to uh, the Muslim youth around the world. Uh, such a loss. From du'at ala abwaab jahannam, from dies, callers to the gates of hell. Callers to the gates of hell. Limada. لِأَنَّ الْخَوَارِجْ كِلَابَ النَّارِ They're callers to the, to the depths of the hellfire because the khawarij are the kilab al-nar. They're the dogs of the hellfire. Fire. Come on, call the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wasallam. Then Imam al tahawi he mentions another hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He says the hadith of Abu Sa'id narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "When two caliphs, uh, caliphs are sworn uh, allegiance to, they have bay'ah, kill the one that secured it later." So this is in case the leaders are there's fighting you know, rebellion within a kingdom or within a, uh, a Muslim stronghold and two people arise, another one arises to uh, take the authority of the, the, the first. 
Uf bin Malik ta'ala, reported that the Prophet wasallam said, the best of your leaders are those whom you love and who love you, and for whom you pray and who pray for you. The worst of your leaders are those whom you hate and who hate you, and whom you curse and who curse you. Uf asked, should we not take up the sword and fight them in, a, in such a situation? The Messenger, uh, messenger of Allah, uh, O Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, No, not as long as they establish the prayer amongst you. Listen, if you have a leader over you and you see that he is doing something sinful, you should hate his sin, but should not defy his commands. And this is a hadith in, uh, a hadith in Sahih Muslim, also Ahmed, also uh, Al-Bayhaqi wa Ghayru. So again, Ahabatifillah, this shows us the importance. And this hadith right here, Imam al Tahawi, uh, Imam Ibn Abi Iz, is showing us, is cementing that foundation for us by mentioning so many uh, narrations of the Prophet ﷺ to show us the impermissibility of really cursing the leaders, praying against the leaders, rebelling against the leaders. And the scholars. Some of the scholars of contemporary time, they mention in some of the details about this issue that uh, 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 rebellion is of two types. That there is uh, rebellion of the tongue and rebellion of the sword. Rebellion of the tongue is basically you're speaking openly about the leaders. You are, you know, you're speaking about the leaders when there's no maslaha. There's no benefit in it. For example, even if you had a gathering of people, you're in a country which is very far away from another Muslim land, and you just get the people excited and you're speaking about the leader. What is the benefit of that? In that scenario, perhaps you may be getting sin of the leader because it's actually bite, backbiting a Muslim. There's no masla. There's no actual benefit in you sitting and speaking ill of the Muslim leader, even if he's a wicked sinner. What is the benefit for that gathering? Is there a benefit? No. I think we can easily agree that there is no benefit. How much more so if you're under that Muslim authority, meaning you live in such and such Muslim country and you, you have secret gatherings, perhaps, as a lot of those contemporary groups do, or, and this is also from the Sifat of the Khawarij and others, and that you have these gatherings and you have these things in order to speak against the leader, to curse the leaders, to ridicule the leaders. So then what this causes is it causes more rancor, more discord, more disunity, more hatred for the Muslim ruler until perhaps some of the people might act upon that. So it only increases the hatred between you and them. And perhaps it may even cause those who are more people of action to do some evil acts, which we see, especially in contemporary times. We've seen it countless times, suicide bombings, other things, people in their own ha homelands, people, this is well documented, even in certain Muslim countries, killing their own mother. And these were followers of ISIS, killing your own mother because they felt she was an impediment to their jihad and something weird. Two brothers, they killed their mother. That's how, did, how do you reach that level of being a dog of the hellfire. How? So it shows the brainwashing mentality and all of this is from the, the, the encouragement to rebel because this is exactly the manifesto and some of the de declarations from those people of that jama' ah based on batil and falsehood and bid'ah and how they encourage people who could not join them and make hijra to them, how they encourage them. Well, at least do fitna and folda and chaos and evil in your land. This is literally what, it's well documented from their own magazines. I've read it with my own eyes. I'm sharing with you nothing but the truth, bi'idnillah ta'ala. And so it's, we see the dangers. This is why the scholars, they mention the two types. So that's the, the type of the tongue, you know, and that could even include speaking on the mimbar, whatever the case may be, speaking about the Muslim rulers and attacking them, speak, especially in a negative way. It doesn't mean you praise them for evil, that doesn't mean you support them in evil. No. So that's a misunderstanding that some people more in contemporary times probably have fallen into. No, there's no extremism. The usul of Ahl Sunnah is very clear. But what we see, what does Imam al Tahawi mention here? What does Imam Ibn Abi Iz mention? What do they say? 
They, they mention very clear the impermissibility of revolting, the impermissibility of, you know, causing uh, and making take fear of the Muslim ruler without the right to do so. Because if, you know, we're the scholars, this is their, this is in part the scholar's role and in part the judge's role. Because this requires a hukum al ma'ayin. This requires a ruling, a judgment on a particular uh, leader or a particular individual. So it's very important to know and understand this. And we see how Ibn Abi is, is really, he's bringing up all kind of nasus. It's just nas after nas to really cement this asl min usula ittiqada ahl sunnah. He is just going uh, very strongly in cementing a very important or, or, or supporting a very important foundation of ahl sunnati wal jama'ah, which differs from ahl bid'a wal ahwa, the people of desires and innovation. And then he says, he comments after this, after he brings that nasus, he says, the book and the sunnah prove that obedience to those in authority is obligatory so long as they do not command anything unlawful. And that's what we said. He says, Allah has said, obey Allah and obey his messenger and those in authority amongst you. And basically he's mentioning what we've already discussed in regards to that and we've detailed quite extensively. He then goes on to point out another point. He says, as to the rule that we should obey, meaning those, as far as obeying those in authority, even if they are unjust, meaning even if the leader is unjust, it is because the evil that would result from revolting against them would be many times worse than the evil which resulted from their injustice. So it shows us that from the usul of Ahl Sunnah, it's being patient and it's being patient with the emir, as, as the Prophet ﷺ said directly in the Nas, you know, being patient with the emir and hearing and obeying. And this is just some of the logic he's giving you, some of the logic behind it, some of the hikmah, some of the wisdom that they witness from those early people and other uh, that that revolted, and you know, from deducing this from. Uh, from their intellect and looking at the nasus, you know, looking, trying to look at the hikmah, the wisdom behind it. And he says, in fact, by patiently bearing their injustice, we atone for many of our misdeeds. So it's a way of atoning for your sins because you're patient and add to our rewards for Allah has only inflicted them upon us on account of our misdeeds. SubhanAllah. That's why the Salaf used to say, you get the leaders that you deserve subhanallah the rule is that the recompense of an act is in accordance with the act itself subhanallah so here imam uh, imam uh, ibn abi is is given us a qaida uh, fiqhia you know a fiqh based principle which is uh, al jaza min jins al amal that the reward for some part of the reward of something is that it's comm commensurate with the deed. So this can work in a negative or a positive way. This can be in a negative or a positive way. And we've talked about this more extensively in some of our other uh, lectures. And in, in regards to this, the rule is that the recompense of an act is in accordance with the act itself. So I believe what Ibn Abi is, is pointing out here that more specifically that uh, by being patient with the injustice of the leader, that you will have uh, and and their misdeeds, it will add to your reward, and that that will be a type of uh, you know recompense. Your recompense, your success, your goodness will be that your sins will be forgiven because you were kind of patient. And I don't know if it might be appropriate to say forgiving of the leader sins, but you were uh, patient with it. So then, therefore, your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to have, you know, expiate your sins and give you relief due to that. He then goes on to say, 
Hence, our duty in such situation is to strive in repenting, seeking forgiveness with rectifying our behavior. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whatever misfortune happens to you is because of the things your hands have wrought. And for many of them, he grants forgiveness. Uh, and this also is showing us that principle as well, al jaza min jins al-amal, in that if you are disobedient and sinful, this is what has become the norm and what you accept, then you will get rule, rulers, you will inherit leaders over you who are disobedient and sinful and oppressive. You've oppressed yourself by sinning. And so now you will have leaders that oppress you and by sinning and being oppressive to you. So that's your recompense. That's a part of your recompense. al jaza min jens al-amal. al jaza min jens al-amal. Uh, and the last point, just in this issue, so it shows how extensive, look how Ibn Abi Iz, you know, went into detail about this, this issue of rebellion. He says, hence, if the people want to get rid of the injustice of an unjust ruler, they should themselves abstain from doing wrong. al jazam and Jin Salam. Malik ibn Dinar said that in some of the heavenly books, it states that Allah has said, I am a law the owner of the kingdom, the hearts of the kings are in my hands. I make them a blessing for those who obey me and a curse for those who disobey me. So do not worry about kings. Repent, I will make them merciful over you. Uh, this is a statement. Al-Haythami noted that a tabarani recorded this as a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his Ma'jam al Osat on the authority of Abu Darda. But one of its transmitters is such that the hadith scholars do not accept his reports. And so this shows that we cannot, this is a, on a, a, a weak narration, but in meaning, it's very much clear, it's very uh, much in accordance with the Medhab of the Salaf and the other text, which show us uh, that we mentioned the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that, you know, we uh, inherit what we have wrought with our, you know, what we have done with our own hands. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, to accept our good and forgive our evil and bless us and protect us and forgive us of our many sins. And until our next lesson, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad kama salayta ala Ibrahim wa ala Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid wa sallallahu wa sallam. على نبينا محمد وعلى عليه وصحبه وسلم